The South African Bar Association is a voluntary association of LPC registered advocates operating nationally with its head office based in the global center. With its membership drawn from all nine provinces of South Africa, the association has seen rapid growth and is destined to become the biggest bar association in Southern Africa in years to come. The South African Bar Association is a LPC accredited vocation training provider and conducts pupillage training for aspiring advocates. The ongoing training and development of junior advocates and legal practitioners is a cornerstone value of the association who thereby seeks to improve the quality of legal representation in our courts. The association's flagship afternoon programs have won the respect and support of the judiciary, academics and practitioners alike. But most importantly, the association is committed to advancing the course of female legal practitioners and is continuously exploring and supporting initiatives aimed at making this objective a reality. Membership of the association is free for practitioners starting off in the profession. It is only after the third year of practice that a nominal membership fee is required. For more information, visit the South African Bar Association at www.rsabar.net. The South African Bar Association, transforming the legal profession. Over to you, Renal. Thank you so much, AJ. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, as you know, the South African Bar Association hosts a speaker on a weekly basis to deal with a legal topic intended to assist legal practitioners and any other interested parties, both locally and internationally with training and development, which feeds into the core values that we hold as an organization. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce our colleague advocate, uh, sorry, Nikatiku Nikwashu, who's going to talk to us on the regulatory framework in the financial services law. And again, this week, I must say, a topic which I certainly have a lot to learn on. Just a short bio. Advocate Nikwashu is a non practicing advocate in the High Court. Uh, of South Africa. He's been working in the financial services regulatory environment for about eight years now. This include both in the public and private sector. Specifically, uh, he first cut his teeth in this field while working for the lead policymaker, the National Treasury of South Africa. And of note, in particular reference, he was involved in work geared towards the adopting of the Twin Peaks reform process, first by being involved in the drafting of the Financial Sector Regulation Bill and related public commentary, as well as parliamentary, parliamentary processes. He currently foresees the implementation of the same bill, now the Financial Sector Regulation Act 9 of 2017, while sitting as a senior analyst within one of the peaks as established by the Act. Mr. Nkwashi has written quite substantially on various topics relevant to the financial services regulatory framework, predominantly anti-money laundering related articles, which was published in the Dairavis. He authored two books, uh, one, A Lawyer Who Never Was, I must say, I hope to hear a little bit more about that, and the advocate's journey into the financial services regulatory law, and that's a 2022 publication. Academically, he possesses an LLBLRM in banking and stock exchange law, a certificate in compliance management, a certificate in money laundering controls, as well as in legislative drafting, policy development and management, 
and he's currently pursuing a further certificate in board governance. My colleague, over to you. We're looking very forward to hearing from you. No, thanks a lot, Ronel. And uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank the association first for just giving me this opportunity to come and address this uh, sort of like new lucrative area in terms of regulatory, because I see that when you're looking at the other traditional bars, this is not something that they look forward to. Even when you check the bias of some of the practicing advocates there in terms of their areas of expertise or what they want to do, they don't necessarily even consider it as law. So it's quite interesting to see that uh, for the association, you are stepping outside of the norm. So you're not going with the status quo just to say, as an advocate or as a lawyer, you just have to go the traditional route, which has to go to do with the traditional court appearances and whatnot, because things are quite shifting uh, 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 and in a fast pace, especially within the entire legal uh, profession. Even when you're looking at the uh, the Legal Practice Act and some of the objectives that is trying to achieve, as well as the legal practice, uh, the legal services uh, uh, charter. If I can just take it a little bit, a bit there, so it's all transformation, transformation. But unfortunately, we are not seeing. Uh, that much uh, coming out in terms of the implementation part of it. So for me, it actually even gives me a, a great pleasure to be addressing an audience that it's also just yes, a, 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 like I said, it's stepping outside of the norm. So in terms of some of my publication, like you were touching in terms of the lawyer who never was again. So I think it's still also even on the similar vein to say, when you are talking about a lawyer, it's not necessarily a law in the traditional sense because things have since moved. So on the other one in terms of uh, the advocates changing the financial services regulatory law, if I can give you a little bit of a brief background. What also uh, encouraged me to write that book now that I've just published recently was one of the articles that I've just written to one of the journals within South Africa, just trying to flesh out some of the new uh, areas that are coming with the coming into effect of the Financial Sector Regulation Act, which is necessarily a regulatory framework for the entire financial services regulation, if you want to to, to put it that way. So I had that article just trying to break it uh, into two pieces where I was saying uh, transformation does not necessarily have to sit in the issues of your color and whatnot. So let's also talk about expertise. And then when we're talking expertise, Let's talk about expertise in some of the lucrative or the new and up and coming areas like your financial services regulation. Because when I was just at all also trying to look at some of the publication of the Law Society of South Africa, I saw that in terms of some of the lucrative or where some of the lawyers were making money to be planned, it was just also highlighted to say this was in the financial services regulatory space. So hence I've written that book. I did not want to respond to the journal that said I should just split it into two in terms of transformation as well as just trying to point out some of the lucrative areas that you are supposed to be looking at. So I think pretty much uh, that was the background in terms of what led me to be writing that book. Okay. Well, just to just to uh, remind our audience, I'm going to um, let you do your thing. We're all very curious to learn from you. And then at approximately 22 five, um, I'm going to uh, turn to the questions um, on the platform. Our colleagues are asked to post the questions on the platform. And I will facilitate um, uh, handing those questions over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, no, thanks a lot. So uh, in terms of just uh, a little bit of background on my academic, I think you've already uh, touched much on that. So, but what I can also touch on is that for me, it was just quite an opportune moment when I came into this financial services regulatory framework or field when I was starting with the policy maker, because my team started uh, in 2015. So when I started in 2015, that's when uh, the financial sector regulation bill was also just introduced for the National Treasury when I was still working for the National Treasury. So for me, being part of that public commentary process, especially on the financial uh, sector regulation bill and also on the market conduct policy framework, it sort of provided me with a view uh, as well as understanding some of the uh, background dynamics when you have to be interpreting or carefully interpreting some of these key pieces of legislation. 
Also, just as an example, one having to understand that why does the FSR Act, for example, refer to financial sector regulators and pinpoints the PAO, that is the Prudential uh, Authority, as well as the financial sector. And on the other side, you see that for the financial intelligence and then also even for the national credit regulator, it's quite a separate uh, uh, so wading when you're looking at the act. So I was just a preview in terms of also trying to get some of those uh, background dynamics. So for, for, for me, I just wanted to follow a certain pattern or pointers in terms of this presentation from my side. So I looked at it in terms of just uh, providing uh, what I would call a historical background. Just first to also just highlight to say when it comes to the the Twin Peaks reform process that was introduced in pretty much I think around 2011 when uh, the National Treasury published the Red Book or what we call the, the policy paper as a, 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 a financial sector to save South Africa better. So from that, in fact, I, I did not even want to start it from 2011. I wanted to start it from 2004. First, with the tax team group report into the Competition Commission in the South African Banking that was published by the Competition Commission. I, I, all of these that I'm going to be touching on are going to be tying well with the entire promulgation where of the Financial Sector Regulation Act or the effecting of the Twin Peaks, if I may, where you also just have a dedicated conduct regulators as well as a, a dedicated prudential regulator. So just going through this timeline, taking it back from where there was no regulatory authority in, in, in at, at first. So that, like the one the one that I also just want to go back to, it was that first task team group report into the Competition Commission in the South African banking sector. And then it was also just followed by a feasibility report into the competition in the banking and the national payment systems. So these two reports pretty much they were also just trying to look at some of the abuses or the market conduct, the banking market conduct uh, that were a pain point for most of the customers in South Africa, given that prior you did not have a dedicated conduct regulator that was also had an expanded mandate to be looking at the conduct of banks and other payments of providers. So another uh, event that was is also even relevant for, for the present purposes is the global financial crisis when you're looking at the 2007 and 2008. So when you're looking at the global financial crisis, even if you, you take it back to its root, just back to the US where all this started, you see that most of this was in relation to the issues of how some of the biggest financial institutions, they conducted themselves against their customers, even where they were just offering them some of the mortgage loans without having that much guarantee to say the customer will, will, will going to be able to save his debt. So which also just spiral out of control. And then it also had an impact on us as South Africa, even though when you go through some of the policy papers of the National Treasury or some of the uh, the, the motivating documentary when they are publishing some of the drafts, uh, drafts which are in relation to this Twin Peaks reform process, you can pick up that they're saying that no, there was not much of an impact in terms of uh, the financial system of South Africa because we are highly regulated and then we're well regulated. So, but from a conduct perspective, this is quite relevant when you're looking at the fact that this had to do with the issues of mortgages which were issued in, in America where most of these uh, uh, financial institutions were just focusing much on making profits uh, at the expense of everything else. Even the books that have been quite recent written substantially in those uh, environment also bears uh, evidence to this. Even when you check the issues of your collapse of, of the human brothers as one example, so that is what is also touching on this. So in 2008, like formerly now, there was this banking inquiry report to the competition commissioner, uh, but the inquiry panel. So this is the one that is also being referred to as the Jali Commission report. So this one again was also touching on some of the conduct issues that have been unearthed here in South Africa, and also just trying to make some of the recommendations. The key to which was we need to have a regulatory in a, a, a authority that is going to be dedicated in looking at the market conduct of banks, as well as the payments providers. So following from 2008, uh, like I said, it was in 2010 when the National Treasury published the Red Book. The Red Book is just a catalyst to the Twin Peaks, if you look at it, because it also just laid down what is supposed to be uh, captured within the Financial Sector Regulation Act, as one example. 
also what it has to be captured in terms of protection the, the the interest of customers from a market conduct perspective and it's also even touching on the issues of financial crime or financial integrity so that one that's taking into account the amendments which were recently made to the financial intelligence center act which are quite uh, represented a significant sh a shift in terms of how regulators as well as regulated entities were supposed to be complying with uh, the provided regulatory instruments. For example, when you're looking at the amendments to uh, the financial sector, uh, no, 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 to the Financial Intelligence uh, Act, you'll see that it was pretty much introducing a rules-based approach for the regulated entities, which also apply to the regulators as well. So you are doing away with the, the situation where you are using the rules-based or the tick box approach, which was used previously. So one of the disadvantages of a tick box approach was that it did not apply equally to all the regulated financial institutions or players, because some might have the resources or even the risk that they are posing to the financial system as a whole were not the same. So when you have a, a risk-based approach type of uh, setup, the only thing that you have to do first is to do your assessment, whether it's from a regulatory perspective or from a, a regulated uh, entity. So you are given that leeway to do your first your risk assessment, and then as per your risk assessment, you'll be able to allocate your resources accordingly. So what is a little bit tricky for the regulated entities is that that shift just requires for you to be able to demonstrate to the regulators that you're also complying with some of the principles. Because when you're looking at the legislation that are promulgated under a, rules, a, a risk space a approach framework is that they are at a principle level. So they just said a principle in terms of the details it's up to you as a financial institution or a regulated financial institution in terms of how you are going to be uh, putting the necessary controls in place. But the key issue again is that how are you going to be demonstrating to, 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 to the satisfaction of the regulator to say you are compliant with so and so. And if not, you can also, if you are a low risk in terms of that risk assessment or the risk rating that I'm talking about, you can also ask for exemption if that is possible under a, an entire uh, a risk based framework. So an, uh, another uh, key milestone, I think, within the financial uh, services regulatory framework happened in 2017 when the FSR Act came into effect. So the FSR Act is taken as a first phase in effecting the Twin Peaks reform process because you also have the outstanding conduct of financial institution bill that is going to be consolidating all the market conduct uh, pieces of legislation under one umbrella. So essentially for the FSR Act, if I can just touch into that, what it also represents is just that establishment of two dedicated regulators, which was not uh, uh, the same previously. So this uh, establishment of two regulators, the first one is the prudential authority. So this one looks at the issues of financial soundness uh, as well as efficiency, uh, as well as stability. So which is housed within the South African Reserve Bank. So in terms of the other uh, uh, twin, which is created under the FSR Act. So this one is specifically the Financial Sector Conduct Authority. So what is quite interesting about the financial, the, the, the proper establishment of the Financial uh, Sector Conduct Authority is that now we are uh, doing away with uh, the old uh, Financial Services Board. So for the Financial Services Board, the way that it was structured, it was sort of like compliance driven or maybe driven by what we call a black lot, a black, uh, a black letter law, where it's purely a, a a compliance specific as opposed to the current FSEA that is also uh, 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 starting to adopt the approach towards having a risk-based supervisory approach. So under the FSB, it was mostly the issues of just being compliant with the letter of the law. So if the law lays down these requirements it means that was the end of it. So I think it gels well with the literal interpretation of the law. So the literal interpretation of the law, I think it's a little bit dated if you're going to be looking at the financial sector regulatory framework now. So looking at the approaches that are being are being, are being adopted, like respect, like I said, even uh, the couching of some of the key pieces of legislations when you're talking about some of these acts being couched at the principle or at a higher level where they're just laying down a principle. And then so for, for, for a traditional or a typical lawyer who wants to take a key piece of legislation and say, this is what section one says, 
it's going to be a little bit difficult. So we're going to be needing uh, that mindset shift to say, you might need to have a little bit of your risk management skills as opposed to not uh, only subscribing to that uh, literal interpretation to say, but this is what section one says, and then we're not going to be deviating. So here there is a little bit of room of deviation because the discretion is in the regulated financial institutions hands, but taking into account the principle that we will have set at the, at the higher level. So another key milestone uh, that I've just noted again here, it's what happened in 2018. So yes, in relations to the, what we call the World Bank Retail Banking Diagnostic Report. So this is just the study that was commissioned by National Treasury. So it was just also building on the work that was also previously uh, initiated by the Competition Commission as it relates to some of the abuses within uh, the banking space. So these uh, retail banking diagnostic reports will also just be making a little bit of some of the findings, especially as it relates to your transactional accounts. So they are also making some of the recommendations in terms of like, let's say, for example, having a dedicated market conduct regulator that is going to be looking after the conduct of banks and other payments providers. So the gist of uh, this or maybe most of these findings and recommendations on the retail banking diagnostic have now just been absorbed again in 2020. So now they've been absorbed within the conduct standards of bank. So this is conduct standard three of 2020. So this is the conduct standards going forward. That is going to be laying down the regu regulatory expectations of banks to say this is what we want to see as a regulator in terms of how you're treating your customers. So the issues of the six TCF principle is also quite uh, important also even for this one because it forms the basis of that conduct standard uh, three. So even the conduct standard three again is just a mixture of uh, some of the risk based uh, principles or the principle based uh, uh, sections as, uh, as compared to some of the rule space. So a little bit of the rule space if you're looking at the conduct standard for bankers, one example, it's in relation to the R section eight uh, on the conduct standard, which deals with the issues of complaints management. So the rest of the other sections are also uh, uh, couched in a principal manner or in a risk based manner. So you don't necessarily get some of the specific in terms of what is expected from you. So, but I think what is interesting and then what is also quite typical in the media when you're looking at this conduct standard. So, but we're having now to also even emphasize that it came into effect. The first two sections, they came into effect in July 2020, and then the rest, they came into effect in July 2021. So I, I'm just saying, just for interest sake, one of the key sections also just to note within uh, this conduct standard for bank is the section nine, which deals with the issues of termination of accounts. So previously I had also even uh, written a, an article with this before it came into effect, which I had titled it the Gupta Clause, giving some of the background dynamics in terms of that environment when the Gupta, when the banks were closing some of the Gupta's accounts. And then there was also just a push, even on a policy perspective to say, we need to have a section within the FSR Act or maybe within the Coffee Bill that is also going to require or request the banks to be able to keep, provide reasons where they're going to be closing accounts. So I know that this is quite an interesting and, and a contentious issues, but when you're looking at that section within the conduct standard for us, pretty much for me, it doesn't change much because now it just requires for the banks to be documenting and having some of the system in place as it relates to the termination or refusal of the accounts. And then what is also quite key again, so this was something that was also even on the code of banking practice, is that you are also still going to be retaining some of the exceptions there in terms of uh, providing reasons to the customer. So the exemptions will be in relation to maybe your anti-money laundering and other key pieces of registration because this conduct standard doesn't apply also in isolation. So what is key also just looking at some of what is going on in the media now is that the position has not changed much uh, in terms of the closure of accounts where the banks can unilaterally go ahead and do that. Even if uh, one can try to come up or come up with defenses like uh, the issues of uh, transformations, the issues of forum shopping going to the several tribunals and whatnot, I doubt from my side that it's going to help much given the fact that the precedent that we have that is capturing the current status quo now, it's a decision of uh, the Supreme Court of Appeal. Now that I'm just making a reference to that uh, leading case of uh, Braden Camp. Okay, so enough about that. So 
looking at the 2021, what I think it's also just quite important for 2021, uh, it's just the, the follow up uh, publication of the coffee bill. So, but for this one, it's just focusing on some of the consequential amendments. So, this one was just published for public commentary in terms of just trying to check some of the key pieces of legislation that are going to be affected uh, by the coffee bill. So, another interesting uh, argument or views that I found being raised in the industry, or whether the financial services or whatnot, it, it, it will be people who are saying, they don't want to get their housing order in terms of getting the right controls in place or maybe uh, complying with the key sections of this coffee bill uh, 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 as an example. So, but for me, that one, I, I just take it as a non-issue because if one pay closer attention at what this is trying to establish, it's not to represent an overhaul in terms of some of the conduct uh, legislations which are in place. So what it's representing is just a consolidation under one umbrella. You might have a two or three sections which are introducing something which is new, but pretty much it doesn't uh, change anything. So on the Twin Peaks reform process that I was just talking to, which has been given effect to with the FSR Act, I, I, I've just also noted uh, from the association's website to say, some of the cases that uh, might interest the practitioners or some of the attendees here on this forum might be cases that have to go to the financial services tribunal which have just been uh, recently established under the fsr act some of the cases that might also just interest the practitioners in practice might be the issues around the debarring of some of the key or the significant individuals in some of these financial institutions so, but what I've also just picked up in terms of the financial uh, services tribunal is just to caution maybe some of the practitioners before taking on some of these cases, uh, just to say if a, a case or, or, or something does not have uh, or it does not touch on the issues of financial services as defined in section three of the FSR Act, or even the issue when you're looking at the aggrieved or, 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 or in as it relates to a decision that has been taken by a decision maker as per uh, some of the key provisions of the act, you might find that it's it's it's, it's not looked at. So uh, you'll find that the tribunal just a raise a point in the minute to say this does not have a jurisdiction when it comes to the financial service tribunal. So, but the creation of a financial service tribunal is quite key and it's important because even when you're looking at some of the debarments, like previously under the FACE Act, when you're looking at the debarment processes, they were prone to be abused by people who could just, just debar each other for whatever reasons they wanted and then you will just have to wait a bit before you can get your department lifted or you just have to rely on other FSP that is going to uh, recommend you to the FSC so that you can be removed. So I, I, I also just touched on, from my point, just, just touched on uh, on the issues of dedications, which I've also touched previously when I'm looking at effecting Twin Peaks and the FSR Act. So the dedicated regulators that I've also talked to is your prudential authority as well as the FSCA. So in terms of specific mandates, I've also even touched on that. So, but what is quite also interesting is that is the issue of transformation, because I was just also looking at the previous report or maybe some of the presentation that were made in 2017 at the Standing Committee of Finance, which were decrying to say within the financial services sector, it's one of the hardly reformed sectors. So it was also just quite interesting for me when I'm just trying to tie this with uh, the procurement protocol for the legal professions, which were also published. And then some of uh, the discussions which were taking place within industry, especially within the banking, where they were also just trying to ensure that they capacitate some of your junior advocates of color so that they can be able to take on some of the banking related matters. So, but I think something that is also just going to be helpful to the attendees here is having regard to the latest or the recently published uh, transformation strategy by the FSCA which is also trying to set out, uh, set out an approach in terms of how the FACA wants to tackle the issue of transformation. What is also quite key there is just to see 
that in terms of your triple B E or the financial sector codes, you find that they don't have that much legal effect or teeth. So, but in terms of just pushing that transformation objective from the regulatory perspective, you see that there are proposals to say under the coffee bill, uh, this argument is going to be up and raise the bit uh, and, and then ensure that maybe there are administrative penalties or fines in case where some of the targets which are going to be set. So it's quite, it's it's still going to be a, a little bit of a long way looking at, at the delay that is also just taking place on the coffee bill. So, but it's interesting to also even follow that. So for others who are also, so for others who are also just still uh, uh, interested uh, on also following what's happening within the industry, whether banking or financial services. I think another key documentation that you can also just have regard to is the 2018 inaugural uh, strategy of uh, the FSCA as well as the follow up that was just published now in 2022, because it also charts or maybe gives someone an, an, an idea in terms of where the regulatory framework of South Africa is going, even though for these ones that I'm talking to specifically might be geared towards the issues of market conduct. But I think that's an area where most of the people can also get a little bit of some work and then also uh, grow from. So from my side, uh, again, the last one that I'm also just wanted to touch on is was the conduct of financial institution. That this one I've also just touched on to say it's phase two uh, in terms of uh, ushering in that twin picks reform process, which we also just adopted from other regulators like Australia, for example, as well as the UK. So for this one, I just also wanted just to flesh it out to say it's pretty much a consolidation of the existing conduct provisions which are sitting in different ex activities based legislation is not necessarily a complete overhaul when you want to look at this one and then for me a little bit of a, of a challenge with it is that uh, it has been in parliament for quite some time and for now one can even though for now we're saying one can still have regards to the activities or the sector specific laws if they wanted the redress so but yeah these are some of the key issues that i wanted to just touch on because pretty much uh, when you're looking at the financial service regulatory and you want to take it back in terms of background because we are, we are in a profession of just sweating the small stuff so so in a nutshell it was just the introduction of uh, this twin peaks reform process as per the red book published by the national treasury that is the sex a a a a a a a a a uh, the paper that was published in 2011 that I'm referring to. And then as a second phase, you can look at uh, the promulgation of the Financial Sector Regulation Act, which was just uh, a, a establishing formally the, the, the regulators. And then you go down, you can maybe digress now to look at the extended mandate, especially for, for the FSCA in relation to the extended mandate to be to be regulating and supervising the conduct of banks and some of the other payments providers. So. But uh, maybe for complete sex, in terms of uh, the extended mandate for the FSCA, where you're looking at uh, the other payments providers, it is still going to be a little bit of a long process as there are still some discussions in terms of just agreeing on some of the jurisdictional lines, as well as also just taking into account where there is still a little bit of some amendments as in relation to the National Payment Systems Act. So I think it might be of interest for practitioners who just want to be specializing in that field as well. So just to also make sure that you keep yourself in terms of knowledge, you can also look at those regulatory strategies that I was talking to, because they also talk to some of these issues. And then also talking at, uh, uh, at the FSEA, also just taking a portion in terms of conduct regulations for credit agreements or trying to agree some jurisdictional line with the national credit regulator. So, but most of these, uh, some of them have already been burdened down in terms of the details where you find that there have been memorandum of understanding signed between the PA as well as the FSA. Some have been signed with the FIC. So, but I think for, for practitioners, if I can put it that way, if you're interested in this, I think uh, the future uh, for me, I can say it looks quite bright. But again, you will also need uh, to have a little bit of that mindset shift to say maybe if you can have regards to that purposive uh, interpretation type of a setup, as opposed to be the literal and then you can be able to survive and thrive in this one because there are quite it being a quite a new area especially from the banking perspective of it you'll find that there are quite uh, 
uh, many requests for 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 for, 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 for opinions uh, as even as it relates to so no one actually knows or quite owns this space if i can put it that way so you'll find that there's quite a lot of work for legal practitioners where people just want to understand from the legal to say how do i even interpret uh, this section some also just want to understand to say if i'm just uh, cited as a party in an application which goes to this tribunal or this court so how am i affected uh, as a new conduct regulator because this is something that i haven't done or seen or experienced before so there is quite a lot even looking at some of the legal opinions that have since been drafted so it also assists i think when you're looking at from the perspective of uh, drafting some of the opinions the legal opinions as well just to be having this uh, background that i've just uh, briefly touched on so yeah from my side i i think uh, that's it and then I can just take questions but uh, I just wanted to follow this presentation point that's just to be touching because it, it might take a little bit of some time if we wanted to get into details so thanks a lot colleagues uh, I, I yeah thanks a lot um, thank you might I um, just relay a question from advocate Bart Ford to you he asks what type of disputes can be referred to the financial services tribunal so the disputes that can be referred to the financial services tribunal for 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 instance yeah. it's a uh, dispute which relates uh, let's say whether it's from a banking perspective or maybe from an insurance perspective the disputes which can be referred there uh, it's, a, it's a dispute where a, a, a decision maker maybe like a regulator uh, for for instance if we're talking about the financial sector conduct authority they have taken a decision uh, to uh, it's not even not necessarily only regulators even the regulated entities if they are taking a decision which is advice to the interest of the customer so that is a, a, a but you you also just want to be careful just to tie it with the definition of a, a financial services as per the the, the provision of uh, section three so if there is a dispute whether it's in relations to accounts it's in relation to payments as long as it, it suffices under the definition of financial services, those disputes can be taken to the tribunal. So, but it, 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 it's a little bit of a chain just to say you can take your disputes to your bank, for example, where you are aggrieved, and then the bank does not satisfy you, and then you go the routes of just going to the relevant ombuds, and then even the relevant ombuds, you are not satisfied, you take it to the FSCA. Because now even within the FSCA, you will have dedicated departments like banks, for example, and then you take to the banks and then us as a decision maker, we still make a, a, an adverse uh, finding against you, but you see it yourself to say, maybe you do have merits or you do have arguments that you can still advance. You are pretty much welcome just to take it. So we are being termed as some of the decision makers in terms of the act. So if it's for financial services, you can still take it to the tribunal and then they see how they can assist you there. So even most of the debarments cases, they rest there at the tribunal. Thank you for that. And I see um, our colleague Romeo Tambellini has raised his hand. Romeo, let's hear it. Again, uh, uh, for the presentation, uh, uh, Mr. Nkwash, I really enjoyed your presentation, although I'm not, uh, I don't have that much knowledge on financial services uh, conduct, but it was a wonderful presentation. I just have a question relating to your view on the mutual bank and then uh, versus the banks act in line with uh, what happened with the you know, deposits at the municipalities you know and then uh, you know what is your take whether the you know the mutual bank is still necessary or needs to be amended to be brought in line with what is actually happening today uh, and then those issues relating to those investments and your take and also my other question relate to 3 360 the you know the, the, the issue of creditorship and the disqualification based on the qualifications and uh, fraudulent qualifications, you might have seen it you know, in court now in terms of what the prudential authorities have done you know, uh, relating to the appointment of the curator thereof and the qualifications. I just need your views on those small things. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I think on the 361, I'm not that quite much knowledgeable. So, but on the first one, because I think uh, maybe uh, the time has moved to just also just revisit that act. So, but it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a case 22 if you check what the mutual banks are are, are, are there to do or, or in terms of the act as well as vis-a-vis -vis 
the retail banks in terms of the banks act and then now you have to also put it take into account the issues of having your the mfma the money whatever so for for me maybe it's it, it's quite a discussion that is also just beyond me but uh, i would like to say maybe even that time is quite ripe for now but i i, I don't think I, i've got uh, that much of a view or an answer from for, for you for you advocate okay no sir. thank you very much i appreciate uh thanks okay you seem to be playing it quite safely <laughs> <laughs> it, it just it just has to be to be honest because if you're looking at what the mutual banks are there to do even the cooperative banks are there to do so it's quite different from conducting the business of the bank in terms of the bank banks act so you you find that even the views that are being raised they have got a little bit of politics in it when you're looking at the issues of your vbs and whatnot so but i think the greatest bank uh, they they call it the greatest bank heist can also just elaborate a little bit further there's advocate mutau views as well Right. I see um, uh, Amit. Amit, uh, you have a question and then after you, Pumulan. Thank you so much, Ronald. Thank you, Council. Council, my question is as follows. Do the rules vary depending on the size or complexity of the banking institution? Yeah, so to, to, to be blunt now, when let's say, for example, we are taking Capitec as an example. So I'm just using this example. So when you're looking at uh, the product offering of Capitec, even well as its business model, uh, as well as the complexity there, and then the structure, and then you compare it to APSA, even when you're looking at the issues of market share, so they are not quite the same. So when you are doing your risk assessment or risk rating and whatnot, you cannot say the rules should apply the same for Capitec as against the APSA, even taking into the account the issues of resources. So just to be blunt, they can they are not applying the same because we are not taking rules now we are taking principles and then for absa specific they will do their own risk assessment taking into account their 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 business model the issues of complexity the nature of the products that they are offering and then for capitech you might be a little bit lenient to say but overall when i'm comparing the two of you the risk rating is not the same the other one is higher risk because when you're looking at the market share and the resources the product offering is quite well is quite huge so it's not the same Thank you, Council. Thank you. Then Pumulani Niembi, I see your hand is raised. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kwashu, uh, uh, for the presentation. Uh, you've just seen now what Segunjalo has taken the banks to court. So do you think maybe they should have also, maybe before going there, they should have come to the tribunal, maybe? So, 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 <laughs> So for for Segunjala, it's not necessary. We can't necessarily say now that they're going to court because you see the court that they're going to. So the first one is an application that is going to the Equality Court, and then the other one, the other leg that they are also just trying to 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 use is the leg of the Competition uh, Commission Tribunal, where they are alleging uh, the issues of collusion and whatnot. So, but it's going to be difficult also just to be to be to be able to to prove that and then if you're checking even some of their media houses or some of their media outlets your IOLA, you will see that they are also just main, mounting that ball paint but the ball pitting that type of uh, attack where they are also just writing some of the articles you will see even the article where they are also referring to say judge here they have said no the party commission and whatnot so to put it bluntly, when you're looking for second jala, even if uh, I, I might be wrong to say this in a platform of like this, they don't even they don't have a case other than just to be appalling to the issues of transformation, trying to drag the the competition commission into trying to drag some of the constitutional and uh, the constitution uh, I don't know alleged constitutional rights that are going to be violated in using the number of the customers that are going to be affected or impacted. So it's a whole lot of stuff. It's it's a little bit quite funny when you're checking it. That they are fighting it from all different sides. So for APSA, for example, they tried to go to court even the interdict rule. So, but it does, it didn't work. So now, the only regard that they have to is the tribunal collusion. You cannot prove that. So you go to the equality court. So if you go to the equality court, what are some of the grounds that you are still relying on? The same grounds. You are saying you are a company that was established before apartheid. You are contributing towards transformation and whatnot and whatnot. But that is beside the point because even for divorce, if the ma the marriage is broken down irretrievable, what's the use now of forcing someone to say, please still stay with this guy? 
because it, for, for, for me, it, it doesn't, it's not going to, to, to assist Sokunjalo in any way. Like I said, <laughs> it's not going. So this marriage doesn't work. Again, because if, if you are looking at the application of this conduct standard for, I understand that they came into effect now, the Sokunjalo matter is something that happened previously. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> no, I, I was seeing a, a question there. So even taking that it happened previously for me this this is what it's also even happening in canada where banks are allowed to unilaterally terminate customers accounts and then the way that is being viewed even in the media or trying to be discussed is that it's only banks when you're looking at their power the negotiating power to say the banks can abuse customers and whatnot but when you're looking at the balance uh, at that section nine of the conduct standard you see that it balanced even for the customer they can choose to say they don't want to to, to, to bank with so and so and then they terminate their services. So, but uh, for uh, for Sogunjalo, I Sogunjalo, nothing's going to happen there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I see um, Bart wants to know, is racial profiling of customers in banking a matter that can be challenged? And if so, let me add a tale. How would one go about that? What what would be considering the topic, the framework in financial services law that you shared with us? Uh, how would one go about that? Uh, unfortunately, if you can just try to, I don't know where you can put it. So it doesn't have, in terms of a basis of a regulatory framework, it doesn't have, because this thing is not happening for the first time. So if you have read in the media, you would have seen that FNB has been constantly being uh, accused of this to say when it comes to fixing rates so for for the people of color you find that the rates are higher so for for white people for example the the rates are a little bit low so but unfortunately it's just a matter of he said she said so but in terms of a regulatory instrument it doesn't have a place for now so even that position when i'm just trying to do a little bit of my research around some of these relevant uh, regulators they hardly even have a position because it's something that is being sensationalized in the media you'll find some of uh, the outspoken uh, 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 journalist saying they are going to be fixing that. So now they are going to be publishing a book. They've got evidence for so and so. But for now, it's just purely an alleg allegations of he said, she said, this is what is happening in so and so bank. These are whatnot. So um, <laughs> we are just working with uh, with allegations without uh, any evidence to it. So, but in terms of a regulatory instrument, uh, no, we don't have currently. Then if I could ask you, Nkateku, um, and, and it's uh, one of uh, my passions um, for our young colleagues. If our colleagues and especially the pupils that um, I um, have invited to, to listen to what you were sharing with us this afternoon, if they have a particular interest in this side, financial services law, what would you recommend to assist them to do to go and see um, financial services law in action? Where do they go to attend hearings? Um, what, what advice could you give them to become more au fait from a practical point of view? Um, with this particular subject of the law. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, we are a little bit wanting in terms of a forum where you can see people arguing or trying to raise arguments in terms of, because I see even for the financial services type, you know, it's closed, so it's not even open to the public. So, but I think for, for to assist even some of the people, given even the interest, you can just follow some of these relevant news uh, newsletters uh, from your relevant regulators, your Reserve Bank, for example, the Financial Sector uh, 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 Conduct Authority, even some of some of the apprenticeship, uh, even some of the bus services. You can also just try to cut your teeth there because they will also just provide you with uh, an opportunity to get that uh, much exposure. So. It's, it's it's just pretty much just going to some of some of the key regulators within the uh, within the the financial services space. Like I said, policy making you can go to the National Treasury. They offer a post grad program which go, which pays quite well. Because if I remember previously, it was paying for something like your eighteen thousand a monthly. So then they take you for two years, and then you can also try the cadet program within. Uh, 
the South African Reserve Bank, which is quite also good. And then they can also even absorb you thereafter. And then you build that years of experience and expertise before you can go back to practice and then specializing. And then you can also, like I said, you go to your financial sector conduct authority. So in there, you'll also even get an exposure to say, these are some of the other regulators international which are much sure that i must follow in terms of the relevant literature that i can be utilizing when it comes to the financial services because you see the financial services environment of south africa has to also just comply with international best practice and standards so we are copying these from abroad so you can also even subscribe to some of these uh, uh, relevant whether it's prudential if you want your google alerts just to be sending you everything that has to do with prudential or uh, 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 authority or prudential regulation, the market conduct regulation. So these are some of the stuff that I've done previously when I was also just trying to get a little bit of exposure and expertise. Uh, it's just it's just a little bit challenging that just to say for me, this this is an area that I've also just picked up trying to come up with a thesis for a PhD. So mm -hmm. for market conduct, for example, you don't have necessarily written books or books which have been written quite substantially from a south african perspective taking into account our individual domestic circumstances so yes. where, you, where, you, where you find some of these published uh, papers like conduct for example you'll find that it's a couple of professors from unisa so and then the method that they were use or gathering is was just the question and answer try, trying to ask from some of the, the the banks in terms of saying this, how do you approach conduct and whatnot so but in terms of academic literature out there even some of the books are quite wanting if you get a, a, a summary again where the, uh, the some of the biggest law firm trying to summarize the regulatory framework of south africa you'll see that they, they are having regards to the banks acts which is something else touching also your face and whatnot and what but specifically if we take in conduct regulation you don't have much so it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, a, a hard one for now. So, mm -hmm. but I'm just hoping that it's going to mature going forward. And then we'll see most of the publication coming out, even some of the space opening up for people to acquire some of the knowledge as it relates to the financial services industry. Even some of the law firms, when we're going down, it can be a little bit encouraging to see some of the smaller firms saying now as an area of expertise or area of specialization, this is what they do in terms of financial services regulatory. Mm -hmm. That's that's very insightful. Thank you. I see Sipo asked when it comes and Sipo, you must just help me here. You used an abbreviation if um, I get it wrong. You said when it comes to CC companies, if there is a partner who does not want to sign, but 80% of the members are prepared to take credit, is um, there a reason if the bank declines the credit. Um, Sipu, if you want to unmute yourself and just reformulate in case it didn't come across properly. Let's see where Sipu is. Hi, good day. Hello, Sipu. Hi, now, so basically what I'm asking is, if a banking institution um, refuses your credit on the basis that not all members sign, so like, with, when signing with the company, you come across the, the factor that they say all directors must sign. So in a CC, they say um, all, all members must sign. Well, not all members must sign, but you write a resolution rather. So within that resolution, so long as your percentage is higher than the amount of, um, how do I say it? The amount of um, like so long as it's higher than the hundred percent, you're capable of following through with what needs to be done, like with the with the credit. Does that make sense? Yes. No, I think maybe this is a it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one for me. I I don't have much insight into that because if I I get you correctly, is that if majority let's let's talk company now. So if majority of the directors in a company are saying we are voting to get credit and then 20% doesn't, and when you take it to the bank, the bank they are reject, the rejecting based on the rejection of the minority, if I'm hearing correctly, is that correct? That is 100% correct. Yeah. And the amount that uh, the, the amount you're saying, the 20% is exactly what's not agreeing. 
Yeah, no, for this one, I don't have much insight into that. Uh, I will be lying if I, I try attempt to, uh, to answer you. So, but I think in a company setting, we, we will go with the majority. So I doubt if a bank will just say, we are not going to be assisting you, whereas the majority. So in a company, now we are going back to the issues of your memorandum of incorporation. So what are you agreeing on in terms of how you're going to be running the affairs of the company? Is the majority role? Or what is the resolution, the percentages and whatnot? So I think this one, I'll just leave it to advocate and Tamim. Yeah, I see a hand. That, that would be Romeo. Let's hear yeah. you, Romeo. Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, advocate, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you've, you've given him a correct answer in terms of what the requirements of the company law uh, now says. It says the, the majority rules and the, and the memorandum of association and the constitution. So if it's vetted by the majority members, then it will have to actually go. Yeah, okay, no thanks. Yeah. So um, one of our guests, Tanzi, uh, Tandi, asked for some clarification. Her question was, does the financial sector offer any programs for students? And if so, how does one go about acquiring the information and exposure? So you've answered some of it, and um, I checked in with her, and she said, please, could you just clarify that for for um, us a little bit? Okay, and uh, thanks a lot. So the, 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 the short of it is that they do, and uh, for now, I think she's quite uh, lucky that for now they've just opened, and then I've shared some of them in my LinkedIn page, especially for the South African Reserve Bank, the program that they are running, they've also just opened for now. And then I think even for the financial sector conduct authorities, they are still open for now. So she can just uh, revisit, she can just visit the website of these uh, respective regulators or just visit my LinkedIn page and then she'll be able to get assistance and then also just check in terms of some of the requirements on that way she, if she wants to apply and qualify for those. Thank you, Mukatiko. We've we've done good time. I don't see any more hands. There's a thank you coming through from Tandi. Um, uh, and if there are any other uh, further questions, um, I found you on LinkedIn um, quite easily. So um, for our delegates, I would recommend that if you have any further questions for Mukatiko, that that you are able to reach out to him on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm so happy that the South African Bar Association records these programs, um, especially if it's a field that's uh, got a lot of new information and things to learn. One can go and listen to it again in bite sizes. But thank you so much for your time. <clears throat> um, thank you for sharing um, your, your unbelievable knowledge and experience with me and my colleagues, and um, we'll see you around. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. And lots of thank yous coming on the on the chat box as well. Um, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure. And for me, I think it's even going to be more quite interesting going forward into the future, given that for, for now, most of, of, especially even from the market conduct perspective, you find that most of these are just quite, still theoretically we are not even quite sure in terms of the practical application so but if you have regard to some of the regulatory strategies that are being uh, published by these respective uh, institutions which are looking after the twin peaks reform process or the fsr act if i can put it that way you'll find that it's also just trying to chat the way forward if you look previously for the fsc as an example it was detailing to say this is the work that we are starting in terms of after the adoption. So, but looking to the current 2022, you see now they are starting to try and implement some of their regulatory strategies. So it, it's quite exciting because you're always learning. And as a lawyer, you know that it's a lifelong skill that you must acquire. You learn until. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And colleagues, we'll see you next week, Thursday, same time, same place. Enjoy your evening. Thank you, Gonzalo.